Good morning, students. Um, last week, we had a look at the format of our statement of cash flows. So we know that we've got a main statement, which we draw up on the direct method, and we've got a note, which is basically our cash generated from operations uh, disclosed on the indirect method. Uh, so, so we are now aware of the format and the layout and what is required of us. So today, the main focus will be to, to design techniques and methodologies for us in how to arrive at the various figures that we require for our statement of cash flows and the note to the statement of cash flows. For that purpose, we are going to use question three from the question bank. I've adapted it slightly uh, just to make more sense in the modern era. Uh, just, just uh, I can almost say cosmetic changes. For instance, I've just changed the wording of property to investment property because that is the name of the standard that deals with investment property. Uh, and a few, like I said, mostly cosmetic changes. Now, if we look at this question, ladies and gentlemen, let us first go and see what is required of us. So we're going to scroll down to the requirement part. We also see there's uh, additional information and so forth. But first of all, we want to see what we must do. So what is required of us, and this is basically standard for all our questions, will be the statement of cash flows for the year ended the 30th of September 2020. So all that will change is basically the date. Uh, and then the note to reconcile the net profit before tax with cash generated from operations. Now, it doesn't really matter which one we do first, uh, but the fact is, in order to arrive at the figure for cash generated from operations, we will have to complete the, the, uh, the note before we actually uh, will be able to complete the, the, the main statement. So we might as well start with a note, ladies and gentlemen. So we're first going to do a note. Now, let us just go and look at the financial statements that have been provided to us. And this is really an exam technique that we are now talking about. So we are seeing here that we've got a statement of financial position with the current year column and the previous year column. We need both of them in order to complete the statement of cash flows. Let's see what else we have. Then they also give us a statement of comprehensive income for the year in the 30th of September 2020. And then in some other questions, they would also have provided, oh yeah, they're providing us with a statement of changes in equity as well. So here we've got a statement of changes in equity. So we've got all the financial statements that we require in order to be able to, to complete the statement of cash flows. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I always suggest in an exam situation is, uh, well, we, 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 we start with our statement of financial position, but then we go and have a look at our other statements, our statement of comprehensive income, our statement of changes in equity. We are going to look at the various additional information and we identify first what kind of activity it relates to. And I tell you why I'm saying that, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, in most uh, tests and assessments and exams, uh, time is always an issue. So it's, it's, it's almost not possible to go and read this same question three or four or five times in its entirety. So it might be a good idea, first of all, to go and identify which activities each sentence or each line item relates to. And then you know that if you've identified it as, let's say, an investing activity, you are only going to refer back to that line item when you are dealing with investing activities. So let us go and do that, ladies and gentlemen. And I want you to be, uh, to, to, to be very reactive and responsive this morning, as usual. So um, let us go up to our okay that's our statement of financial position so maybe let's let's do it in the order that it is that it is presented to us so let us look at the following additional information they say on the 31st of may 2020 250000 preference shares were issued at 55 cents per share 
Share issue expenses of 1,150 rands were paid. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our first question of the morning is what kind of activity would that transaction relate to? If you can type for us, you can, you can just use abbreviations as well if you want. What kind of an activity would that relate to if we are talking about the issue of preference shares? Financing activity. Thank you, Enrique. Financing activity. Exactly. So maybe we can go and indicate it as such. So we're going to indicate that with an F. And let's make it a red one. Right, so that's a financing activity. So we're not going to refer back to that paragraph when we are dealing with operations. And we're not going to refer back to that if we are dealing with the other operating activities. We're not going to look at that paragraph again if you are looking at investing activities. We're only going to refer back to that paragraph when we are dealing with our financing activities. Then in our second paragraph here, they say during the year, the following transactions took place with regards to the non-current assets and were included in the profit before tax. Now, we don't even have to go and read any further, but we will. Uh, so they are saying investments, uh, which cost 62,500 rands, were sold at a profit of 6,225 rands. Property, in this case, investment property. Let's maybe change that. Uh, investment property was sold for 260,000 rands. Now, let me just go and see whether it didn't change my formatting. No, it's okay. Uh, was sold for 260,000. No further sales or purchases of property. Let me just format that. Uh, were made during the year. And then they also say no equipment was sold during the year, but that does not mean that no equipment was acquired. So we must be very careful when we read this, right? So that whole paragraph, ladies and gentlemen, it deals with investments, it deals with investment property, it deals with equipment, and they've actually mentioned it. it, 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 it it's transactions that took place with regards to non-current assets. So that whole paragraph, if you can type for us, what kind of activity does that relate to? What kind of an activity does that relate to if it deals with non-current assets? Investing, thank you, Asisipo. So that deals with investing activity. So let us go and indicated for us as such so we'll indicate that with an i let's make it red again so we're only going to refer back to this paragraph two when we are dealing with investing activities right then they say there were no components of other comprehensive income so that does not affect our cash flow sta or statement of cash flows in any way uh, and then in paragraph four, they say an additional short-term loan of 50,000 was raised during the year. So that will affect our statement of cash flows. So now we can go and identify what kind of activity does that relate to. What kind of activity does that relate to? If we have taken out a, an additional loan, we said last week, tongue in cheek, that whole section deals with so called own capital and loan capital. Financing activities, thank you, Henri. Quite correct, right? Financing activities. So let us go and indicate it first. If I can, here we go, financing activities. 
Right, ladies and gentlemen, so we've gone through the additional information and we've identified which activities they relate to. Now let us go and have a look at the extract from uh, the uh, statement of comprehensive income and let us see whether we can identify what kind of activities they relate to. So the very first one that we've got there is revenue from sales. Revenue from sales. Okay. So what activity does that relate to? It's wheelings and dealings with our customers. Operating activities, and I even want to go a little bit further, thank you. I even want to go a little bit further, not only the operating activity section, but in particular, the operations themselves, because that has to do with our wheelings and dealings with our customers, right? The sales to our customers. So let us go and indicate that. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Let us go and indicate that with an O. Then the second line item there is revenue. Once again, revenue, but from interest income. Interest income, ladies and gentlemen, what kind of activity would that relate to? If we think about the, the format of our statement of cash flows. Also an operating activity, quite correct, an operating activity, but in this case, thank you both Enrique and Asisipo, uh, but in this case, not our operations themselves. You, you remember the cash flow that is related to interest income is something we refer to as interest received. So the name of the cash flow is interest received, but it is directly related to the income, which we refer to as interest income. So that was below our cash generated from from uh, from operations, right? So that is one of the so-called other operating activities. So we're going to indicate that with an, a double O, other operating activities. Then, ladies and gentlemen, we've got some other income here. The first kind of other income there is profit on sale of investment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Profit on sale of investment. So to what kind of activity does that relate to? To what kind of activity would our profit on sale of investment relate to? Now that investment, as we know, correct. Thank you, Enrique. We know that is part of our non-current assets, so that will be an investing activity. So let us go and indicate that with an I. Then the next item there is profit on sale of property. Profit on sale of property. Now that should not be a mystery now. What kind of activity would that relate to? The property is part of our non-current assets. Also an investing activity. Thank you, Asisipo. Right. So let us go and indicate that with an I. So that is an investing activity. Then, ladies and gentlemen, we've got cost of sales. We've got cost of sales. Cost of sales as a bearing on our wheelings and dealings with our suppliers, our wheelings in dealings with our suppliers. So therefore, what kind of an activity would that be? Operating activity, thank you, as a super operating activity, and we can even go that little step further. And because it has to do with our wheelings and dealings with our suppliers, in this case, the supplier of goods, um, we, we, we know that it is actually part of the operations themselves. So we're going to indicate that with an O. 
is for our own purposes. Then, ladies and gentlemen, we've got operating cost. Operating cost. What kind of activity would that relate to? Now, this one is a little bit more tricky. In fact, the next few will become increasingly tricky, but we are going to sort them out logically. So our operating cost, what kind of activity would that relate to? The name does give us a good idea, actually. Operating activity. Thank you, Enrique. That is also operating activity. So that has to do with our dealings and wheelings with suppliers of other kinds of goods or services, not necessarily our inventory. The cost of sales obviously has to do with the suppliers of inventory, but your other operating costs would include uh, the supplies of, of, of uh, your internet services and printing and stationery and water and electricity, uh, those kinds of things, right? Even including your salaries and wages, that is also part of your operating expenses, right? And we know from, from the first term, we could also have had administrative expense, uh, administrative costs and any kind of, any kind of, of, of core activity within this business. But anyway, so let us go and indicate that for us with an O. Now one that is a little bit tricky, but let's see if we can figure this out for us. We've got finance cost, ladies and gentlemen. Finance cost, what kind of an activity would that be? This one is a little bit trickier. Maybe we can sort it out. We can figure it out all, uh, in, a, in a logical fashion by again referring to our, our operating. Thank you, Asasipo. Thank you. It's also an operating activity, but in this case, it is not part of our operations. It is part of our other operating activities. Maybe we can, we can uh, 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 um, like I say, logically figure this out by thinking what cash flow item what cash flow item is directly related to the expense which we call finance cost interest thank you asasipu which interest interest is not is 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 the right idea but we've got to give it a complete description interest what interest paid there we go thank you so much thank you guys interest paid right and interest paid as we know from the from the format of our statement of cash flows does not fall under the operations but under the so-called other operating activities so we're going to indicate that just for ourselves with a double o then we've got profit before tax, which is just a subtotal, so that, um, that, that we don't have to identify. And then we've got an income tax expense. An income tax expense, ladies and gentlemen, what kind of activity would that represent? Once again, maybe if we want to figure it out logically, <coughs> excuse me, to which to which cash flow item does our income tax expense directly relate to to which cash flow item income tax paid exactly thank you Enrique. right income tax paid and we know that the income tax paid is disclosed under our so-called other operating activity so it is part of our operating activity section but not part of the operations not part of our day-to-day -day trading activities so we can now go and indicate it for us our income tax expense is an uh, an example of a, an other operating activity right and then we've just got the subtotal profit for the period We've got no other comprehensive income, as we've also seen in the in the additional information. And then we've got our total comprehensive income. Right. So all our income and our and our and our cost items we've now identified 
and we've 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 uh, categorized them between operations, other operating activities, investment activities. Uh, normally, we won't find any financing activities here, but it is. Uh, let me think about that. No, you won't find any financing activities here because the financing activities only relate to the capital itself. In other words, the capital that, that, that you, that you uh, obtain through issuing shares or the capital that you obtain through acquiring a new loan and then the capital that you repay on the loan or the uh, shares that you are buying back or the preference shares that you are redeeming. So you normally won't find any financing activity here, only operations, oper other operating activities and investing activities. Now let us go and analyze our statement of changes in equity for the year ended 30th of September 2020. So there we've got our opening balance, there we've got our total comprehensive income. Now clearly we don't have to go and analyze the total comprehensive income again because we've already analyzed the components of the total comprehensive income individually. But then we get to share, uh, shares issued. We've actually uh, already ident identified this when we looked at the, um, the additional information. So really uh, that part in the additional information was not even necessary to be given to us. So that will clearly be a financing activity. We've already identified that. And then we've got share issue cost write-off. That is still related to our own capital. So that will be a financing activity as well. So let us just indicate that. Uh, then ordinary dividends declared, ladies and gentlemen, and also preference dividends declared. We can use, we can do the two of them in combination. So this this th those two are not actually expenses, but they do they do lead to the flow of cash. Now, in the case of both of them, in the case of ordinary dividends declared and preference dividends declared, they both relate to a cash flow item that we call what? And you've got to give me the complete description. Dividends paid. Thank you, Henrique. Exactly right. So that relates directly to the cash flow item that we call dividends paid. And under which section of the statement of cash flows do we disclose dividends paid? Under which section do we disclose the dividends paid? Under our other operating activities. Exactly right. So we can go and indicate that as such now. So that will be part of our other. Hmm, now, am I going to be able to fit it in there? Okay, let's just do it that way. Oh, there we go. Okay, other operating activities. I'm not going to be able to fit it in there. So we must just remember that both those items relate to other operating activities. Okay, so now, now we've, we've, we've got a clear idea where we have to go and focus on. So now let us go and start with the note. We rather start today with a note to the statement of cash flows, and then either later on or next time we'll do the uh, um, main statement. We'll probably get to the main statement uh, later on today, but I don't think we'll be able to quite complete it. Okay, so with which line item do we start our note, ladies and gentlemen, if you can just type that for us. With which line item do we actually start the note? Maybe I can scroll up a bit. That will, should give you a clue. Profit before tax. Thank you, Enrique. Right, looks like you've worked hard on the format of, of those statements already. Right, so we are going to start with our profit before tax. So that is a figure that comes directly from our statement of comprehensive income. Right, there it is. So we're going to start with profit before tax. So we're going to scroll down. We're going to start populating our note. And the first item is profit before tax, 288,491. So there we've got our very first 
line item for our note. Let us just go and double check whether we've got the correct figure. 288491. 288491. And that is exactly it. 288491. And then we are going to make two kinds of adjustments. Let's just talk through this again, ladies and gentlemen. We spoke about this last week, but let us now just go and, 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 and talk about it again. There are two kinds of adjustments that we are going to be making to our profit before tax in order to arrive at cash generated from operations. Now, the first kind of adjustment that we are going to be doing is to take out any income items and any expense items that do not relate to operations, right? So eventually, uh, halfway through this, this, this reconciliation, we want to arrive at a profit or loss that only, only deals purely with our operations, right? That is why we start with profit before tax, but included in profit before tax, there are certain incomes and certain expense items that do not relate to our operations, and we've got to eliminate them. We've got to take them out. So let us go and see whether we can identify those items, ladies and gents. So we are going to scroll up again. We're going to see what we have uh, in our various uh, uh, pieces of information. Let us maybe start right at the top. There's our statement of uh, uh, financial position. There's our statement of financial position. Um, just before we do that, I just want to check something else. Um, Sorry, it's just something that I wanted to go and check um, whether I've included that there. Yes, I have included that there. I've included the figures for depreciation. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so now if we look at our statement of financial position, we can see here that we've got investment property, right? And that is could be at cost, that could be at valuation. And then we've got equipment at cost, and we've got the accumulated depreciation. We've also got vehicles, which is disclosed at the cost, and it's accumulated depreciation. And then we've got another category of non-current asset called uh, investment. So in effect, we've got one, two, three, four kinds of non-current assets, right? Four categories of non-current assets. Normally, um, Normally, as you as you know, this whole section here within that block will be your PPE note, but they haven't provided us with the notes separately. So they've actually indicated the note here on the face of our statement of uh, financial position. In any case, ladies and gentlemen, we now know that the, the, the depreciation expense is an investing activity. It does not relate to our operating activities or our operations. That is what the crucial thing is. It does not relate to our operations. So now we've got to go and quantify what was the depreciation for the year. Now we know that on the investment property, there's no depreciation as we can see, but on the equipment there is. So we started the year with accumulated depreciation of uh, 60,000 rands. And we ended the year with accumulated depreciation on equipment of six uh, of eighty four thousand rand. So what was the what was the depreciation expense on equipment for this current year? What was the depreciation expense? 24,084 minus 60. Thank you, Enrique. Exactly, ladies and gentlemen. 84,000 at the end of the year, 60,000 at the beginning of the year. So that means our, our, our net depreciation expense on equipment for the year was 24,000 rands. Then if we look at the vehicles, 
If we look at the vehicles there at the beginning of the year, we didn't actually have vehicles, right? So we must have acquired that vehicle during the course of the year. So at the beginning of the year, we also did not have accumulated depreciation, but at the end of the year, we've got accumulated depreciation on the vehicles or vehicle, they say, of 30,000. So what was our depreciation expense for the year? Thirty thousand, right? Thirty thousand minus zero is obviously thirty thousand. So there we've got our first uh, figure that we can use in our statement of cash flows. Now the the important or the second important thing besides quantifying it is to go and decide should we add it or should we deduct it. Let us just go and verify our figure first. So there we've got the adjustments, adjustment for. 24,000 depreciation on equipment and 30,000 uh, rands worth of depreciation on vehicles. That gives us a total of uh, 30 plus 20 is 54,000. So that is indeed correct. So that is our depreciation uh, expense for the year. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> we've got to now determine should we show that as a positive or negative? And we can clearly see that we are showing it as a positive, but we need to know why. The question here is, <clears throat> in arriving at your profit before tax, right? Remember, we start this reconciliation with profit before tax. In arriving at that profit before tax amount or figure, did we add the depreciation expense to our income or did we deduct the depreciation expense from our income? When we drew up our statement of comprehensive income. We deducted it, right? It's an expense, so we deducted it from our other, from our total income, our revenue and our other income. We deducted it. <coughs> Excuse me. It's probably part of the operating cost, right? It's probably somewhere in the operate. Well, not probably, definitely is. <laughs> okay, it definitely is somewhere in your operating cost. <clears throat> if there had been other cost categories such as distribution cost or administration cost, it could it would have been in one of those, right? But in this case, we've only got cost of sales and we've got the operating cost. <clears throat> so anyway, it is part of that. So ladies and gentlemen, if if we are deducted the depreciation from our uh, from 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 our income in arriving at profit before tax and we now want to nullify the effect, we want to take it out what do we have to do now in this reconciliation? Deduct it again or add it back? We now want to cancel the effect of that uh, depreciation. Enrique, that, that is what, what, what we are working towards. <laughs> As we'll see, uh, you, you are actually now uh, preempting what I was going to say a little bit uh, later, is that uh, we will see that this forms a trend, exactly as, as Enrique says. So in the note, we have to add expenses and deduct income. That is, that is what I was eventually going to mention once we've worked through this. So that is the trend that we will see is going to be forming. We'll have to basically add back all our expenses and we'll have to go and deduct the income items. Uh, and when I say expenses and income items, those that do not relate to operations. Obviously, if it relates to operations, such as our revenue from sales and our cost of sales, we are not going to adjust for it because that must remain part of the profit or loss from our operations that we are working towards. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so there we have it. So there we have it. So we are adding it back. Now let us go and see what else have we identified as investing activities. So let us go back to our statement of uh, uh, financial position. So we started, we know that we are dealing with 
with anything that has that has nothing to do with 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 our operations so we looked at our non-current assets because that is where we will find uh, the, the 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 information for our uh, something like depreciation another one that we will find there would be uh, possibly impairment losses remember when we did ppe there's also something like an impairment loss and that would also then we, we, we would have had to adjust for if there had been an impairment loss now let us go and look at our other uh, pieces of information here so here they are saying uh, during the uh, during the year the following transactions took place okay there we've got the finance financing activity this is an investing activity so we will have to we will have to refer to this again when we are when we are drawing up the face of the statement of cash flows but let us just see whether there are any hidden incomes or expenses in this in this uh, piece of information we actually get it later on as well so we are just going to see is there any income or expense here yes there is one uh, where they say the investment, which cost 62500 was sold at a profit of 6225 So there we've got a profit on the disposal of investments. So that is an income that would be part of our profit before tax, but that does not relate to operations. Right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that is all that they mentioned there. But anyway, we, we they, they didn't actually even need to mention it for us because we could also have picked it up here from our statement of comprehensive income. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us let us first look at uh, uh, nothing, no O's, ladies and gentlemen. The O's, the operations themselves, we are not going to adjust for because we are working towards a profit. That, that, that deals purely, solely with operations. But all the others, the other operating activities, other operating activities, other, not all of them, we'll see we are working towards another trend here, ladies and gentlemen, but most of them we will have to go and adjust for. So let's maybe start with our profit on sale of investment. That was uh, uh, 6,225. So there we've clearly identified, If just before we scroll down, we have identified that it is an investing activity. And we can see here with our own eyes that that amount was added to our revenue, right? So they were all added to our, our, our income items before arriving at the profit before tax. So it's all included there already. But now we want to go and take it out. So 6,225. So there we've got it, ladies and gentlemen. Profit on sale of investment. Profit on sale of investment. It's an uh, investing activity. So it means we have to go and uh, adjust for that. So that was 6,225. And again, yeah, I know that uh, Enrique has already, already preempted the trend that we were going to illustrate. But again, uh, if you haven't identified that trend yet, uh, then you can you can ask yourself the question: In arriving at that figure, in arriving at the profit before tax, would you have added the profit on on sale of investments, or would you have deducted it? What do you say? In arriving at the profit before tax, you would have added it exactly. It would have been added, ladies and gentlemen. But now because it relates to an investing activity and not part of your operations, we want to nullify. We want to cancel the effect of that, that income. So if, it, we, if we already did, added it to arrive at profit before tax and we now want to get rid of it, do we have to add it again, or do we now have to go and deduct it? We now have to go and deduct it. Thank you. Exactly, ladies and gentlemen. And that is why it is indicated in brackets. Now, let's go up again. Let's go and see what else we have. 
in our statement of, of uh, uh, comprehensive income, we've also got a profit on sale of property. We've got a profit on, uh, on sale of property that we've indicated with an I. So that is, again, an investing activity. So it does not relate to our operations. So that 35,000 rands there, we'll have to go and adjust for. So let us scroll down again, ladies and gents. We go to our note, and there we see it, right? Profit on sale of property, 35,000 rands. And then we can ask ourselves again, in arriving at profit before tax, would that profit on sale of property have been added to our income, or would it have been deducted from our income? It would have been, in arriving at the profit before tax, it would have been added, right? It would have been added to our income. So now we want to go and eliminate the effect thereof, right? We want to go and eliminate the, the effect thereof, so we need to go and take it out. So we cannot now go and, 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 and add it a second time. We now, if we want to get rid of its effect, it means now we have to go and deduct it. That is why that 35,000 rands is also indicated as a negative. So now we take it out of our profit before tax. Then, ladies and gentlemen, let us go and see what else we had there. Um, so let us just scroll up again. So we go back to our statement of comprehensive income. There we see that we had uh, 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 interest income, which was an other operating activity. So even though it is part of the overall operating activity section, it is not part of the operations themselves. It's not part of the operations themselves. So there we've got revenue interest income 1,600. So again, because it's not part of our operations, we want to go and take it out. Uh, so let's scroll down to our reconciliation. And there we go, ladies and gentlemen, there we've got it. We've got our interest income. Don't know why there's an extra space there, but anyway. Uh, there we've got it. Interest income, 1,600. Now, um, we, we can see there's a trend forming, right? So if you, had, if you had an income in your statement of comprehensive income here to, 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 to go and adjust for it, it means we have to deduct it. And where you had an expense that is not part of operations, that was part that forms part of your calculation of your profit before tax. If you want to go and take it out, it means you have to go and add it back. Anyway, so the interest income, we can go through that reasoning again, ladies and gentlemen. In arriving at the profit before tax figure, would we have added our interest income to all our other kinds of income, such as revenue, or would we have deducted it? No, you don't need to type it again, ladies and gentlemen. We would have added it, right? It's income, so it would have increased our profit before tax. But now we want to take it out because it does not form part of the operations, even though it's part of the overall operating activities. So now, because it was added in our statement of comprehensive income, it means now to, 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 to cancel its effect, we have to go and deduct it. So let us go and see whether there's anything else, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so we're going to go back to our statement of comprehensive income. So that, that was the OO. We've dealt with the I. We've dealt with the, uh, that I. Now we see here there's another OO. There's another other operating activities, namely finance cost, right? Finance costs. So now we'll have to go and adjust for that as well. Uh, because it is part of our profit before tax. Remember, the key thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that all those income and expense items form part of your profit before tax, but some of them are not part of your operations. So you can see those that are part of your operations, such as sales and cost of sales and operating costs, we do not adjust for them because the whole point is that we want to arrive at a profit or loss 
initially before we converted to a cash flow that deals purely with operations. So that finance cost of 68,134, we'll have to go and adjust it in our note. So we go back to our note. Oops, now I've gone too far. Uh, so we was it, there it is. There's the finance cost, 68,134 rands, ladies and gents. Okay, so let us go through the reasoning again. Maybe you can type it for me one last time, and then I won't bother you with, this, with the same kind of thing with future questions. In arriving at your profit before tax, would you have added the finance cost or would you have deducted it from your income? Exactly, exactly. You would have deducted it, right? Because it's an expense, you would have deducted it from your income. But now you want to take it out, ladies and gentlemen. So it means you cannot deduct it again. You now have to go and add it back, right? So we're going to add it back. So that will now be a positive figure of 68,134. Um, right, so we've gone through our, our, um, our, our whole statement of, of comprehensive income. We've, 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 we've adjusted for those items that do not relate to operations. So that means at least now we are ending up with a profit or loss. It's not a cash flow yet. It's not a cash flow yet. It's still a profit or loss. But it's a profit or loss that only deals with your operations. And we give it a name. We call it normally operating profit. I know there are some of my colleagues, uh, not, not necessarily at the university, but in practice who prefer um, operational profit. But I think the term that is being used mostly in, in, in practice is operating profit. Operating profit before working capital changes and the working capital changes the 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 point that we are going to 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 illustrate there is that we are going to convert that profit it's still a profit or a loss right we haven't converted to a cash flow yet but by looking at the changes in our working capital we are going to convert that profit or loss into a cash flow you're going to convert it into a cash flow and that cash flow then is purely from our operations in other words our wheelings and dealings with our customers and our suppliers and our employees that's it okay ladies and gentlemen so we can go and add that up so it's a, well, well we'll add that up first We'll add that buck up first. So if you add up all those figures, you get 79775. Uh, and then uh, we take that figure that we started with, the profit before tax. If that had been a negative, we would have deducted it, obviously. But in this case, it's a positive. So we have to add the two together. And that provides us with a subtotal there of 367600. And like we said, that is our operating profit before working capital changes. Now we are going to look at the changes in working capital in order for us to convert that profit into a cash flow, ladies and gentlemen. So the first thing that we really need to know, what is meant by working capital? It is a term that we encounter in, in other topics as well. Uh, the, the analysis and interpretation of financial statements up till 2019 was part of financial accounting too, but then we had a major recurriculation and uh, the analysis and interpretation of financial statements is now part of, it's, it's a topic in financial accounting three. But in any case, the reason I'm mentioning that is that you'll also encounter the term working capital, that same term there, working capital, when you are going to be doing uh, uh, the analysis and interpretation of financial statements. So we've got to know what is working capital. Is there anyone who wants to give us a few uh, ideas about that?
if we if we actually look at the 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 answer there, they are they are mentioning the increase in inventories, decrease in trade and other receivables, decrease in trade and other payables. So, ladies and gentlemen, we in a nutshell, and and you'll have to make a note of this for 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 the purposes of the statement of cash flows, or at least this note, but also for future reference when you get to other topics and they refer to working capital. So, your working capital. Um, I hope you've all got a little pen or pencil and, and, a, and a notebook or something with you. Your working capital relates to your current assets. Current assets and your current liabilities. That has to do with operations that is the key there ladies and gentlemen if it has to do with your investing activities or if it has to do with your financing activities or if it has to do with your other operating activities then it is not part of your working capital so i'm just going to repeat that uh, just for the sake of clarity ladies and gentlemen your working capital relates to your current assets and your current liabilities that relate directly to your operations, right? So that will be uh, inventories, for instance, because that has to do with your dealings with your with your uh, both your suppliers as well as as your customers. So your customers and suppliers uh, inventory has to do with that. In the case of, of of your trade and other receivables, it has to do with your wheelings and dealings with your customers. In the case of your trade and other payables, it has to do with your wheelings and dealings with your suppliers and, uh, and, and, and depending on the circumstances, also your employees, there might be uh, 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 accruals of wages or, or, or uh, accruals of salaries at the beginning or end of a year. But in any case, ladies and gentlemen, if, if it is something like shareholders for dividends, shareholders for dividends we know that is also we know that is also a, 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 a other operating activity right it's a it is it has it has a direct relationship with your with your with your uh, dividends paid uh, Mariva, can you just repeat that one last? Which part, Mariva? I'm not sure which part. The, the whole part about the about what is working capital. Let's maybe start there with what is working capital, and then hopefully I repeat what 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 you want me to repeat because I'm not sure actually what I, if I can remember exactly what what I said after that. Uh, your working capital consists <clears throat> consists of your current assets and your current liabilities that are directly <clears throat> related to your operations. In other words, it has. It must have something to do with your wheelings and dealings with your customers uh, and or your suppliers and or your employees, right? So that is working capital, current assets, current liabilities that relates directly to operations. So therefore, we have seen, uh, this is also something that I now remember saying, that that uh, uh, inventories, any movement in your inventory balance from the beginning of the year to the end of the year uh, will have to do with your wheelings and dealings with both your customers as well as your suppliers. Because on the one hand, you source, you procure your inventories from your suppliers, but then you also sell them to your customers. Right. So that has that has definitely uh, is, is directly related to our day to day trading of uh, activities, which is our operations. In the case of the trade and other receivables, it has to do with our wheelings and dealings with our customers, right? And in the case of a trade and other payables, it has to do with our wheelings and dealings with our suppliers, suppliers of inventory, suppliers of other services, suppliers of, of labor, our employees, in other words, and so on. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, now we've got to go and 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 uh, uh, see 
what increase there was or what decrease there was from the beginning to the end of the year. But just before we do that, just before we do that, there's actually something that I've forgotten about. Um, and I'm glad that I'm thinking of it now. I just want us to go and have a look at our statement of comprehensive income again. And then I'm going to ask you a question. If we go to our statement of comprehensive income, we see there was another expense, another expense that we indicated with a double O. In other words, it, it, it was it, it, it has a bearing on our other operating activities. Now, the question is, should we go and adjust for our income tax expense in that note as well? What would you say, yes or no? Should we go and adjust for our income tax expense? No, exactly, quite correct, Anrik. We don't go and adjust for, for, for the income tax expense. Why not? Why don't we go and adjust for the income tax expense? That is now a little bit of a tricky one. Is there anyone who wants to, to, to take a guess or take a stab at it or give us an idea? We've, we've gone and adjusted for, for all the other OOs and for the I's. Why don't we go and adjust for that OO as well? The reason, ladies and gentlemen, is we did not start with that figure. We did not start our note with profit for the period. If we started, if we had started, which we didn't, if we had started with profit for the period, that would have meant that the income tax expense was also deducted already, right? then we would have had to go and adjust for the income tax expense as well. But we didn't start the reconciliation with profit for the period. We started the reconciliation with that figure, profit before tax. In other words, to put it differently, the income tax expense was not deducted yet. Right. So we started with a figure where the income tax expense was not deducted yet. If we had started with that figure where the income tax expense had been deducted, yes, then we would have had to go and adjust for the income tax expense. But traditionally, we start our note with our profit before tax. They even in the requirement said we must provide the note. Uh, I'm not going to scroll. Oh, maybe I can. I think it's just here. To, to uh, provide the note that reconciles net profit before tax. Remember, before tax with cash generated from operations. So the reason why we don't adjust for the income tax expense, now I'm repeating it again. So Mariva, you don't have to ask. <laughs> I'm just pulling your leg. Uh, so I'm going to repeat that, ladies and gentlemen. The reason why we don't adjust for the income tax expense is because the figure that we are using in the reconciliation, the income tax expense has not yet be, has not been deducted from it already, right? We start with a figure before income tax. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm just happy that I remembered to point that, that out because I wanted to do that earlier. Now, if we look at our changes in working capital, what we are really doing here is that we are, uh, in a nutshell, in, in, in summary, what we are doing here is we are eliminating the effect of the accrual system. This is what this changes in working capital is all about. We are in that first kind of adjustment. We took out any income and expenses that do not relate to operations. And this is our second kind of adjustment within this uh, uh, reconciling note, where we now go and nullify the effect of the accrual system. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us go and see. Uh, what what kinds of items we find in our statement of uh, uh, financial position that 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 uh, 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 deal with well, well first of all that that is a current asset or a current liability but then that also deals with our operations so let us scroll up to our statement of financial position. 
So there, ladies and gentlemen, let us see. Under our current assets, under our current assets, we've got inventory. That's our inventory. I know this is now very obvious, but I still want to see whether we're on the same page. So when we are looking at our inventory, right, our inventory, does that have a direct bearing on our operations? In other words, our day-to-day -day trading activities, our wheelings and dealings with our suppliers and customers. Yes or no? What would you say, ladies and gentlemen? Does it have a direct bearing on our, on our operations? It is the heart of our operations, isn't it? It is absolutely the, the nucleus of our operations, right? So inventory is definitely a, a part of our working capital. So now we've got to go and determine, did our inventory increase or decrease from the beginning of the year? you can tap it increased right it increased let me just make it open it on my side again it increased from 65,600 rands to 73,000 rands right so we now know that we can go and describe it as increase in inventory increase in inventory but now we've still got to go and figure out should we show that as a positive or should we show that as a negative now, in this case, there isn't, uh, because we are looking at, at increases and decreases in assets and liabilities, it isn't really truly a cash flow, but it is similar. It has an effect on your cash flow because we now need to go and eliminate the effect of the accrual system. Now, there are many ways in which we can decide whether that should be uh, shown as a positive or negative. But I think the, 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 the logical way is, is for me, maybe the easiest uh, uh, to, 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 to understand. Uh, but there are other ways in which you can do it. We'll, we'll illustrate some other ways later on as well. You can do it by means of reconstructing your inventory at ledger account and so on. We, we will do that in, in, in some future lessons, right? But just from a logical perspective, ladies and gentlemen, we know... That inventory is a current asset, right? So, so what the question is that we can ask ourselves here, this year, at the end of this year, compared to the end of last year, is more of our money tied up in inventory than last year, or is less of our money tied up in inventory? Because really, we must now remember our, when we have inventory, it's our money. Right, our money is sitting in the inventory. The only thing is we haven't sold it yet, uh, so we haven't generated the cash flow from it yet. But our money is sitting in our warehouse, right? So the question here um, is, is, is more of our money tied up in inventory this year as compared to last year, or is less of our money tied up in inventory? Exactly. More of our money is tied up in inventory. Ladies and gentlemen, what that really means is if more of your money is tied up in inventory, it means that has an effect that there is less money in the bank, right? So even though this isn't really a, a flow of cash, it is. it has an impact on the flow of cash. And would you say if more of your money is tied up in inventory? If more of your money is lying in your warehouse instead of in your bank, would that be similar to an inflow or similar to an outflow of cash? Would that be similar to an inflow or similar to, uh, it will be similar to an outflow of cash, right? More money is tied up in our inventory, less is available to be deposited into our bank account. So that means uh, 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 um, the, there's less money possible 
possible in our in, 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 in our cash flow, right? So that will be similar to an outflow of cash. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, are we going to show that that increase? Uh, maybe you can just quantify it for us. So it will be 73,000 less 65,600. Are we going to show that in brackets or not if it's similar to an outflow? Does it give us 7,400? Why does that not look right to me? Let me just go up again. Um, 73,000 minus 400. Yeah, that's actually correct. Okay. So there we can now go and describe it, ladies and gentlemen. Increase in inventory. So in other words, more of our money, 7,000 rands, more of our money is tied up in, in inventory as compared to last year. So that is similar to an outflow of cash. Right, now let us go to the next uh, current asset. So we're going to scroll up again. The next current asset is accounts receivable. Accounts receivable. So, ladies and gentlemen, our first question is obviously whether accounts receivable is part of our operations. In other words, does it qualify uh, 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 to be seen as part of our operations? And we know that our accounts receivable has to do with our wheelings and dealings with our customers. And our cash receipts from customers is definitely part of our operations. So therefore, it does qualify, ladies and gentlemen. So now we must just go and see, did it, first of all, did it increase or decrease from the beginning of the year? Did our accounts receivable from the beginning of the year, 76,000, it decreased. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Mariva. It decreased, ladies and gentlemen. So we know now already that we can go and describe it as a decrease. Now, again, there are quite a number of ways in which we can decide whether that should be shown as a positive or negative. So now let's maybe think about uh, an, an additional one. We're going to look at our original way of, 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 of logical thinking there, and then we're going to add another one. And then, not today, but in a future date, we also, or maybe today, we'll see how, how much time we've got. Uh, we can also go and reconstruct that accounts receivable ledger account uh, if we want to make sure whether it's a, whether it's an inflow or outflow. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with our original kind of, of, of uh, logical thinking here. When it comes to our accounts receivable, which is also where some of our money is tied up in, is more of our money tied up in accounts receivable this year as compared to last year, or is less of our money tied up in accounts receivable? Less, thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Mariva. Exactly. So less of our money is tied up in our accounts receivable balance. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, would that be similar to an inflow or similar to an outflow of cash? Inflow, thank you, Enrique. So that will be similar to an inflow of cash. Now, like I said, let's now think of a of, of a second method that we could have that we could have uh, logically figured this out. So, if, if it's similar to an inflow, it means we're going to show it as a positive. We can ask that question in a in a, in a different fashion as well. Did our debtors pay us better this year as compared to last year? Or did they pay us worse this year as compared to last year? If the outstanding balance is less, if the outstanding balance is less, did they pay us better or did they pay us worse this year? What would you say, ladies and gents? Last year, 
there were 76,000 outstanding, now there's less outstanding. So it means compared to last year, they've actually paid us better because they, there's, there's less money outstanding. I hope that makes sense. That is just a different way of looking at it, right? If, if, if there was more money outstanding this year than last year, it means they would have they, they have been paying us worse this year as compared to last year. But in this case, the, the, the outstanding balance actually decreased. So less money is tied up in our debtors figure or our accounts receivable balance than last year. So that will be similar to an inflow. And we're going to show that as a positive. So we take 76580 minus 7825 and we transfer it down to our note to our cash flows note and there we have it decrease in trade and other receivables 5755 it's simply the difference between the balance at the beginning of the year and the balance at the end of the year uh, and then we've just got to decide whether it should be shown as a positive or negative so is it similar as it as it, does it have the effect of an outflow or does it have the effect of an inflow of cash okay let us go back ladies and gentlemen to our uh, uh, current assets the next one here now now it becomes a little bit tricky we've, we've, we've got to be wide awake here the next one that one there current tax refundable income tax so there at the beginning of the year we had a positive, we had, we had a debit balance. We had a debit balance on our income tax payable account. So we therefore disclose it as current tax refundable because the uh, revenue service actually owed us money at the beginning of the year, but not at the end of the year. Does that have to do with our operations? Does it have to do with our operations, ladies and gentlemen? Yes or no? Does it have to do with our wheelings and dealings with our customers and our wheelings and dealings with our suppliers and employees? Yes or no? Who wants to venture a guess there? Where do we... That is related to which kind of cash flow our income tax expense and our and, and in this case it's an asset, it has a bearing on, on the cash flow item that we refer to as income tax paid. And that is part of our so-called other other operating activities, right? It is not part of our operations. You understand, right? So it means that the current tax uh, refundable, even though it's a current asset. It doesn't have a direct bearing on our operations. So therefore, we're also not going to uh, include it in our working capital changes, right? So that will not be part of our working capital changes because it is not seen as working capital simply because it is not part of operations. It's not part of our day-to-day -day trading activities. Our, as we tongue-in-cheek say, willings and dealings with customers and suppliers and employees right and then the bank itself ladies and gentlemen that is the cash uh, so so that is the target that we are basically work basically working towards we want to eventually indicate where that increase in our money came from we can see there that our bank account increased quite substantially and that is our target there, therefore so we are not going to use that in the reconciliation then we are going to now look at our current liabilities, ladies and gents, our current liabilities. And the first item there is accounts payable. Does that have a bearing on our operations? Does that have a bearing on our operations? Yes or no? Yes, thank you, Mariva. Exactly, it has. It has to do with our dealings with our suppliers, especially, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, that will therefore be seen as working capital. So now we can simply go and 
uh, deducted. We can deduct that figure from that figure. But first of all, uh, well, well, that is the first thing. And then secondly, we've got to go and see, is it an increase or a decrease? So is that an increase in accounts payable or a decrease in accounts payable? Increase or decrease? It went from 71,000 at the beginning of the year, 71,250, and it ended the year on 48,175. Does that represent a decrease? Thank you, Mariva. Exactly right. So that is a decrease in accounts payable. So now we've, we've got the figure. We can deduct the, the, this uh, 48,175 from the 71,250 to get the figure. We can now know, we now know that we have to describe it as a decrease in accounts, in, 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 in accounts uh, payable. Uh, the only thing that is still outstanding is should we show it as a positive or a negative? Now, in this particular case, we have to reason through it differently, ladies and gentlemen, because this is a liability and not an asset. So it is not our money that is tied up in, 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 in creditors, right? It is not our money that is tied up there. It is a question of how are we utilizing the credit facilities that they have provided for us. So we are again going to look at two ways. And there's a third one that, that we'll address later on when, when we do the, uh, some reconstructions uh, with, with maybe a, a, a different question. So, ladies and gentlemen, have we made better use of the credit facilities this year as compared to last year? Or have we made worse use of the credit facilities that our suppliers provide us? The answer there is we've made worse use, right? We haven't made as much use of the credit facilities of their money, the money that they basically supply to us, as we did last year. Last year, we owed them 71,250. Now we only owe 48,000, right? So we've made worse use of their money, ladies and gents. So would that be similar to an inflow or similar to an outflow of cash? What would you say? Similar to an inflow or similar to an outflow? It will be similar to an outflow. There's another way, like we did with the accounts receivable, another way that we can go and 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 and, and logically see what whether this should be uh, as uh, disclosed as a positive or a negative. This year, as compared to last year, did we pay our creditors better than last year? Or did we pay them worse than last year? What would you say? We paid them better, right? We've made more payments to them this year. If we look at the end of the year balance as compared to last year, last year we owed them more but this year we owe them less, so we actually paid them more, right? So we paid them more. So, so if we want to now go and nullify the effect of the accrual system, again, we will see that will be similar to an outflow of cash. So we'll have to indicate that as a negative. So we simply now take the difference between those two figures, uh, 71,250 and 48,175. And then we go and 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 paste it, or we go and write it in, or we go and type it in, uh, in our reconciling note. So there we have it: a decrease in trade and other payables of twenty three thousand and seventy five rands. And as we've seen, that is similar to an outflow of cash because we made more payments to our suppliers than last year. We've made less use of their credit facilities, so it is. 
uh, similar to an outflow. Okay, ladies and gents. So now that is all. Uh, all that is left for us to do uh, is to 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 add up this this little block here. So we've got the minus seven thousand four hundred. We've got the plus five thousand seven five five. We've got the minus twenty three zero seven five, uh, and that gives us a subtotal of minus twenty four thousand seven hundred and twenty. Uh, so then we go and deduct that figure. That is now eliminating the effect of the accrual system. That is what we've done here. We're eliminating the effect on the, of the accrual system on our operating profit. So we are converting that operating profit into a cash flow, which we call cash generated from operations. And clearly now you can also see why this cannot be called cash generated from operating activities because it excludes things like our, in, uh, 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 our finance charges and it in, uh, excludes things like our uh, um, uh, profit on, on, on investments and losses on investments and so on. Uh, well, that, that, that goes without saying, but, but, it, but it excludes specifically uh, cash flows or the incomes and expenses related to cash flows that fall under our so-called other operating activities. So now we deduct that figure from that figure, and we've got a net figure here of 343080. 343-080. And that is our cash generated from operations, ladies and gents. And now we can go and transfer it over we transfer it over to the main body of our statement of cash flow. So there we have that same description, cash generated from operations. And that is that figure that we've now transferred from our reconciliation year. That 343080, we transfer to our main body of the statement. The benefit in that, ladies and gentlemen, the benefit in doing that, if you hadn't done that, it would have meant you had to go and do uh, account reconstructions to, de to determine your cash receipts from customers. You would have to do account reconstructions to arrive at your cash pay to suppliers and employees. But now once you've got that figure, you only have to do one of those two. You only have to do one of those two. And the easier one of the two, the easier one is to actually go and calculate the cash receipts from customers. So in financial accounting too, we are going to first calculate our cash generated from operations. Then when we get to our main statement, we are going to calculate our cash receipts from customers. And then that, that figure, the cash paid to suppliers and employees, will simply be our balancing figure. It'll just be our balancing figure. In financial accounting three, we are also going to look at how you can calculate that figure on its own by reconstructing many ledger accounts. Uh, in the case of this one, cash receipts from customers, we only need to go and reconstruct one general ledger account. But for that one, we have to go and reconstruct multiple general ledger accounts. But fortunately for us, if we have calculated that figure and we've already calculated that figure, then that one is simply the difference, the balancing figure. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let us just pause there now. Let us pause there for a few seconds. I've been talking a lot. You've been typing a lot of answers for me. But now I just want to see, have you got any questions on the uh, 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 note? Let me just scroll down to the note again. Have you got any questions on this note? You're welcome to say it in person. You're equally welcome to type it. Are there anything that is that you're uncertain about or that was that has not come over clearly? No, it doesn't seem like it, ladies and gents. Okay, but in any case, when it comes to the statement of cash flows, as well as the note, like with any other financial accounting topic, you know, the more you practice it, the easier it becomes and the better you understand it. So really, 
uh, financial accounting and many other subjects obviously as well uh, it is really practice makes perfect the more you practice the questions the more uh, the more or the better you understand them right ladies and gentlemen um i know that officially our time is up do you want do you want us to chala or, or can we go on for another let's say 10 minutes or so what do you say Nothing. <laughs> then, um, if if it's all right with you, let us just carry on for a for a few extra minutes. I think your next class taxation starts at one, isn't it? Am I correct in that? Mariva or Enrique or anyone? Does it start at one? Okay, ladies and gents, I'm just going to use another maximum of 10 minutes or so. I just want to talk about the uh, uh, main body of the statement of cash flows. What our techniques are going to be to arrive at these figures, right? We're not going to actually do that because each one of them will take a, a substantial amount of time. But I just want us to work through the principle of how we are going to arrive at these figures. Now, ladies and gentlemen, clearly these figures on the face of our statement of cash flows are only flows of cash. Okay, uh, thank you, Mariva. Um, you will have tax tomorrow. Thank you, Furman. I now see there, Furman says we will have tax tomorrow. And Mariva also confirms that it was cancelled for today. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, then then I don't feel too guilty if, 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 I, if I spend a little bit more time, uh, then at least... Uh, um, you will you will have a, a decent break after <laughs> after this class. Now, when it comes to to um, arriving at the figures for our statement of cash flows, the main body on the direct method, we, we we've mentioned this last week. Here, we only want to show the flow of cash, so there will not be any of the classic elements in there. There will be no assets in there there will be no liabilities in there there will be no equity in there there will be no uh, income items there will be no expense items only the flow of cash and we know ladies and gentlemen that an expense will normally lead to an outflow of cash an income will normally lead to an inflow of cash so we can already get a rule of thumb for us here that if it's an inflow of cash, it's going to be shown as a positive, right? So generally, incomes will result in the inflow of cash. Generally, expenses will result in the outflow of cash. So therefore, those outflows of cash will be shown as negatives. Now, how do we actually get ourselves a technique or a methodology to arrive at the cash flows. That is the mystery that we've got to solve now. And that is actually, if, 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 if we think about an accounting system in general, then we will see, and, and that is why I said last week, this, this statement will test your, your, your accounting abilities very much. We know that on, on the various general ledger accounts, that we that 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 we've been working on since financial accounting one already on the same account on the same account where the accrual takes place the flow of cash is also recorded that is the big secret here ladies and gentlemen on the same account and this is perhaps a good time to to make a little note there on the same ledger account where we accrue an expense or where we accrue an income, 
the flow of cash is recorded on that same account. So let us look at uh, our customers as a classic example, right? We said last week that the, the reason we call it cash receipts from customers or cash received from customers is that it includes cash sales as well as credit sales. Uh, but in practice, ladies and gentlemen, we, we, we know that in our statement of comprehensive income, we are not going to have cash sales separately disclosed from our credit sales. We only have a figure for revenue from sales. So um, I know that sometimes in, in some questions, uh, uh, some lecturers will, will, will give you a tricky little question where they'll say your credit sales was X amount and your cash sales was, let's say, Y amount, right? And the, the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter whether you, you, you are going to use the credit sales first and then add the cash sales, or in our account reconstruction, you simply use the total sales, but then you can't go and add the cash sales again afterwards, right? So you either add it at the start when you do your reconstruction of the account, or you add it at the end, but not both. So ladies and gentlemen, if we look at our customers, on which account do we accrue our credit sales? On which account do we accrue our credit sales? I know that different accountants uh, uh, use different names for their ledger accounts, so it doesn't matter which which version of it you, you mention, it, it is okay. Where do you accrue your credit sales? On which account? On your debtors account, right, on the debtors account or your accounts receivable account. That is where you accrue it. So when you have a credit sale, ladies and gentlemen, and like I said, we're not going to actually do it today yet, uh, but I just want us to get the principle established so that we know how we are going to do it in future. So when we, when we made a credit sale, and we know the accrual system is all about, we record the income or the expense as soon as it takes place, not, not necessarily when you pay for it or when you receive the money for it. When you make a credit sale, you are going to debit your debtor's account. You're going to debit accounts receivable, and you're going to credit sales. So it means that the accrual of that sale has taken place on your debtor's account. Later on, when your debtors pay you, when your debtors pay you, in other words, you receive the money, you receive the cash, you are obviously going to debit your bank account. You're going to debit your bank account with the amount that you've received because it was deposited into your bank account. And which account are you going to credit? Which account are you going to credit? I want an answer here. Yeah. When you this is this is this is really first year accounting. <laughs> when you receive money from from your debtors when they pay on their accounts, you debit your bank account and which account do you credit? Debtors, right? Debtors. So what that means, ladies and gentlemen, and that basically confirms what, what we've, we've said about five or six minutes ago, on the same account where that income, the revenue from sales was accrued, in other words, your accounts receivable or debtors account, on that same account, that very self same account, the flow of cash will also be recorded. In other words, when the customers pay on their, on their accounts. So ladies and gentlemen, what that all points towards is that if we can go and reconstruct, if we can go and reconstruct the account, the general ledger account, not individually, but uh, individual uh, uh, items, 
but but in totality our total sales and our total amounts received from from our customers if we can go and reconstruct the account where the accrual took place on and where the where the where the uh, um, flow of money was also recorded in it means that we can use all our other information all the other figures and facts that we have in our financial statements other than the statement of cash flows to determine the flow of cash so we are going to use the technique of reconstructing the ledger accounts where the accruals took place on one can also do it in table form um, and i think perhaps uh, mr culloden or someone maybe myself uh, will illustrate in, in, in one one or two items in the future where you can do it in in in, in table form but I must say the more logical way is the reconstruction of ledger accounts because there you can almost not go wrong. If you do it in table format, sometimes one can be unsure should you be adding a figure or should you be deducting a figure. But if you reconstruct the ledger account, you know if the item is going to be indicated on the debit side or whether it's going to be indicated on the credit side. So that is the more logical one. So, ladies and gentlemen, and this is my last point for the day, and then I'm going to leave you in peace. <laughs> okay. If we look at our debtors account, our accounts receivable account, we know that we can find the opening balance on that account in our statement of financial position. We can maybe go and illustrate that. So, if we go up to our statement of financial position, we see that under our current assets, we've got accounts receivable, the opening balance at the end of the year. We can also find the closing balance at the end of the year in our statement of financial position. That is why I said last week, Wednesday, that when it comes to your other financial statements, uh, if you are drawing up the cash flows, you can do it from the other financial statements. But when it comes to your statement of financial position you need the current year figures as well as the previous year figures whereas in the case of of the statement of uh, comprehensive income and statement of changes in equity you only need the current year figures but in the statement of financial position you need opening and closing balances so you've got the opening balance on your accounts receivable in the comparative column and you've got the closing balance on the in the current year column then we know that during the course of the year, we would have recorded the sales on that account as well. So for every sale that we would have made, we would have debited accounts receivable and we would have credited sales. So if we now have the opening balance and we have the closing balance, we still need the sales. Now let's see, can we find the sales? Yes, it's actually here on the face of our statement of uh, comprehensive income or otherwise it would have been in our revenue note so we also have the total sales for the year so the only other item that is outstanding is therefore our cash flows the amounts that we've received from our customers during the course of the year so if we now can go and reconstruct that debtors account and we've got all the other information and only the one is outstanding it means we can determine the cash flow simply by balancing off that account so it will be our balancing figure right so that is my last thought for today we'll carry on with this question probably uh, next week tomorrow i think we'll we'll be doing something else uh, when when we've got the combination of all class groups together uh, we will still uh, still need to plan we still need to 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 get a format for tomorrow but anyway we'll 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 finish this question in the future ladies and gents thank you for allowing me that extra 15 or so minutes and thank you for attending and have a lovely day further thank you bye bye